17, Mark chapter 10 from verse 17. Mark chapter 10 from verse 17. Let me do this. Mark chapter 10, there we go. From verse 17, you may stand to the reading of the Lord's word if you can. Mark chapter 10 from verse 17. And then Mark chapter 8 from verse 36. If you are there, say amen. We'll start from Mark chapter 10 from verse 17. Amen. Mark 10 from verse 17. And when he was gone forth, into the way there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Would you please, if your Bible is with you and is not borrowed, try and underline this question. This perhaps is the most important question that anyone could ever ask the Lord, how can I get eternal life? Because this is the underlining reason why you and I are here tonight. Is that right? If not for eternal life, then I think everything else is a waste of time. So we figure out that this is a good question. I always correlate this back to John chapter 3 when Nicodemus goes to the Lord and says that, Rabbi, we know that no man can do these things you do except that God be with him. In other words, except that that man has God acting through him. So would you show me the secret? What must I do as Nicodemus? This is the exact same thing. You fast forward to the book of Acts chapter 2. When they heard the people speak in tongues and the Holy Spirit manifesting, men and brethren, what shall we do? Same thing. So you see this question keeps coming up over and over again because without eternal life, what is left is death and damnation. So it's always important for us to come back and reflect on this. Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The nature of the question has certain flaws in it. I'll come to it. And then also, it points out something about inheritance. Verse 18, and Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but, but one, that is God. You see, the, the word good comes from God. And the word evil comes from devil. It's pretty easy for you to do the correlation and see that good, G-O-O-D, is derived from God, G-O-D. And an evil, E-V-I-L, is derived from the devil, D-E-V-I-L. <laughs> you see that? And so the Lord Jesus says, no one can call me good because there's only one good, that's God. So if you recognize me to be good, are you also recognizing my deity as God? <laughs> you see where this conversation is going. Then he said, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said, Master, all these have I observed <laughs> from my youth. Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him hmm. and said unto him, One thing you lack, one thing. Go your way, sell whatsoever you have, give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. 
and come and take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at the saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust? Watch his words now. See that now he narrows in them that trust in what? riches to enter into the kingdom of God. So he realized that when he said how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom, it, 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 it stumbled their faith. And so he comes a little closer to explain more of what it mean, he means. He does not just mean the mere fact that a person is rich means they are going to hell, but they that trust what? In riches. So their trust is not in God who blessed them, but their trust is in their riches. And because of that, it's hard for them to do what? Enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 25. Then he said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's pray. Precious and Holy Father, we bless the reading of this word, O oh God. Once again, please take these words, Lord. Let it be a blessing to all of us tonight. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. The Lord bless you. You may take your seats. And like I said before, I'm picking on two words from, uh, not two words, but two um, um, sermons that I'm borrowing some quotes from. But I want us to start from just the mere reading of the scripture. Because as always, the scripture should have to be the foundation on which we build. Amen. When we look at this encounter of the Lord Jesus Christ and a rich young ruler, the Bible describes him as a rich young ruler. And we find certain things about this young ruler. Because in his conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we discover that this man loves the Lord. How many realize that? He loves the Lord. The Bible shows that there were other rich men who did not even bother about the ministry of the Lord. They don't care. But this young man went out of his way and sought the Lord Jesus Christ and found him. I believe that it was not easy to get a one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord Jesus with all the disciples and the multitudes that were constantly following him and protecting him, it would be very hard for any man to get a one-on-one -on -one encounter. I'm listening to the prophet's uh, ministration and, and realizing how hard it was for people to even get a prayer card. Sometimes before you show up, all the prayer cards have been given out and there's just no way to come close to him or to approach him. So I'm just thinking of what this rich young ruler would have to do, perhaps see the disciples, maybe do a few good favors, just so they will make it possible and easy for him to get a one-on-one -on -one encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'd love to believe that this man had a desire in him like all of us tonight, having a desire in our hearts to be in the presence of the Lord, not just because we don't have anything to do with our time, but because we realize that one day, like Brother Antoine said during the leading of the song service, one day in God's house is better than 10,000 elsewhere. So we put a lot of value in the things of God and then we come and sacrifice for the things of the Lord. And I say, God bless you for that. That is effort right, rightfully placed in the right place. Because the things we do for God shall never be in vain. The Apostle Paul said that God is not slack to what? To cast a blind eye on our work of the labor of love. God is not slack to forget 
the blessings that come with it. But I want to go a step further and point out that the mere fact that we make an effort to meet the Lord is not just an automatic correlation that, oh, because I made it, God is duty bound to bless me. You see, sometimes because we are human and we are used to cause and effect, we kind of equate it that, oh, if I show up, automatically God has to do what I asked. And at some point, it looks like we make God a genie in a magical box. And, you know, once you rub it the right way, then a genie is going to come out. And, oh, genie, make your first wish, your second wish. And you make those wishes like the story of Aladdin and then some of these other ones we're familiar with. But it's not like that. The God we serve is a God of principle. And it's, it, it, it behooves us, the responsibility is upon you and I that when we approach him, we will approach him by way of God's channel and his principle. See, if you want to be blessed by God, then you want to do things to please God. The Bible says when a man's way pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to reconcile with him. So in seeing this man's effort to, to meet the Lord Jesus Christ and to have this conversation, the Lord Jesus, the Bible says that he loved him. And I believe he, he loved the genuine, the, the genuine quest of this man to just seek the Lord and to know, Lord, I, I've, been, I've been obeying the, the, the law and I've been living by it and I'm doing good, but how can I get this eternal life? A few things that I want to point out from this story when you read it is that this man asked a question thinking that I must do something to get eternal life. And so the, the, the question kind of points out to the fact that there is something that, that I can do on my part. There's something that you can do on your part in order to merit eternal life. And even though there is something that you and I would have to do, the Bible clearly tells us that it is by grace are we saved through faith. And the moment you begin to think that there is an action on your part that can cause God to, to give you eternal life, you begin to make it sound transactional. I, I, I'm doing this and so give me eternal life. And it is very clear and evident that none of the things that you and I are doing can ever, ever guarantee us eternal life. Nothing but pure faith in the finished work of God that he's done for us. The grace of God choosing and doing those things for us that we could never do for ourselves. But see, he is coming from the era of the law where a man's righteousness was measured by his ability to live by the, the demands of the law. So he's used to, oh, I've done this, I've not done that, I've done this, I've not done that. And he's counting the stacks of the things that he's done right. And so, Lord, I've done all of this. What else must I do to gain eternal life? And it is very, very sad that we get to the point where we are in, the, in this end time on God's timeline and his calendar. But somehow the devil still wants a believer to think that, oh, God loves you and is going to save you because of all these things you are doing as a believer. I want to put it the way the prophet put it. He says that the works that we do, they just show gratitude to what God has already done for us. It can never be an exchange for the price he paid on the cross. If we go back to look at the requirements of God to accept a sacrifice for the wages of sin, we would know that we needed a kinsman like Adam, one who was not born through a woman. And so no matter how good you are or how pious you are, you would not qualify in the first place. 
It took the almighty God himself to provide a befitting lamb who can be just in the form and shape of Adam. The Bible calls him the second Adam. One who is a king's man who is not only qualified but also able to pay that price for you and I so that now we can come into God by going through the, 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 the gateway where he paved because he's already Pay the price for us. It's important to remember this. Now that's not to shoot down a believer's responsibility to remain good and to remain in the production of, of what? The fruits of the spirit. But that is for us to have an understanding that I'm doing these things because it is the nature of God in me and it requires me to do these things. But this is by no way a means of barter trade or exchange for my salvation. And so we find him, what must I do? The Lord Jesus answers him by the Lord. In fact, I never realized this until right now that I'm preaching on it, that the Lord drew my attention to it. Do you realize that when he says that, oh, I know the commandments from my youth, and the Lord starts asking him or, or, or referring to the commandments, watch that very, very clear difference between the commandments the Lord points out in comparison to the commandments that Moses gave in Exodus chapter 20. I want us to point them out because you realize that the Lord only spoke on a half of the law that pertained to human relations. Let's go back to Exodus 20. I never really paid attention to it till now. And these are some of the things the Holy Spirit does through his, his, his servants. Because if you look at what the Lord Jesus says, he says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness or defraud anyone, honor thy father and mother. But let's go to Exodus chapter 20 from verse 1. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God which has brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other God before me. Do you see, do you see the difference? <laughs> then he moves on. You shall not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. The next he says that you shall not bow yourselves down nor serve them for I am the Lord thy God. And he says I am what? A jealous God. Is that right? I'm a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children unto the third and fourth generation that hate me. And then verse 6, he says, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless. That takes his name in vain. Verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and, and do all thy works ten. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maidservant, or thy, thy uh, men servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger. That is within thy gates. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And rested the seventh day wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now you see this is the first half of the Ten Commandments. When we go back to what we just read from the book of Mark chapter 10. When the Lord Jesus is speaking to this young man's commitment to the law. The half that speaks of the commitment to God. He did not touch on a single one of that. I didn't realize it till now. But he only goes to the second half. See, the Lord Jesus, when he was asked that master was the greatest amongst the law, 
He took the whole law and then he categorized them into two. The first, he says, love the Lord your God with all of your being. That's your body, your mind, your spirit, your soul, everything. And the second part, love your neighbor. So the, the, the whole law is fulfilled in that one word, love. But love is operated in two directions. One is love to God. And when the love of God is in you, it will reflect in the way you love what? Your neighbor, 1 John 4. If a man says that I love God who, whom he's never seen, but he does not love his neighbor who he sees, in whom God dwells, he says that person does not know God. So we are looking at a young rich ruler standing before the Lord Jesus, showing his love for God through the, the fact that he's obeyed the law, but the Lord Jesus is only leaning towards how his obedience to the law is reflecting in his human relations. And I think it's because that is where we usually have problems as believers. Oftentimes, our love for God is intact. <laughs> oh, we love God. We go to church. We read the word. We try to stay with it. We, our commitment to God oftentimes is almost unquestionable. But you know where we struggle the most? Our commitment to one another. When it comes to displaying that same love that we claim to have for God for one another. So very often we become impatient. We become uh, unforgiving. We run out of, 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 of breath. And we get agitated when it's someone else. See, when it's God, oh Lord, how I love you. Oh Lord, how, you know, because as a believer, you constantly want to please God. But the devil makes it very easy for us to forget that the love of God is demonstrated through the love of one another. That's how the Lord Jesus one time turned and looked at his disciples and he says, By this day would know that you are my disciples. Not when you love God, but when you love who? One another. Because in your demonstration of divine love for one another, you are demonstrating divine love for God. How? How? Because if I believe my brother, my sister is a son or a daughter of God, by treating them well, I believe God lives in them. I'm serving God by serving them. Watch the connection. I thank God for this, for drawing my attention to this. Because I've never noticed that he never spoke one thing about this man's commitment or his love to God. But then he comes straight to it and says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Don't defraud anyone. Honor your father and mother. And then he said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. The sad truth that this is, this is displaying to us is that a person can live in absolute conformity to the, to the commandments and still have a problem. This is where we have to be careful that we do not equal conformity or obedience to the laws to righteousness. I think oftentimes we look at those who, oh man, he's never done this. He's perfect doing this. You know, we, we, we equal that, oh man, that brother is good, that sister is good, oh man. But see, God looks at things differently. In 1 Samuel, he told Samuel at a time of choosing a king, he says that, I, God, I do not look at the outward appearance. And so the Lord Jesus, who is at the word of God at the center of a thoughts and intents, look at this man and he realizes that, oh yes, he's obedient to these laws, but there's one thing that he is lacking. He said, go. You said you've obeyed all these laws, right? These laws that talk about demonstration of love toward your neighbor, Yes, I've done it since my youth. Okay, good. Prove it. Go sell everything you have. 
Go out there and give it to the poor. Give everything. Come back here and live your comfortable life and carry the cross and follow me. You see, God was putting his own testimony to a test. You said you, you, you forbade the law does speak about the demonstration of love to your neighbor. Good, then prove it. How many times are we willing to lay aside our own comfort at the expense of, of what God wants us to do? Is the question. And the Bible says he grieved him because he had great possession. I can imagine him looking back and thinking, man, as a young man, young rich ruler, as a young lawyer, I've been diligent, I've studied the law, I've gone to school, I've got the best paying job, all these sacrifices of my life, I've saved the best, I've done everything, and now I own major estate and great influence in the town, and I, not only that, I'm fulfilling the law, I'm donating to the church, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do and instead of the Lord telling me well done faithful servant I give you eternal life he is asking me to give everything that I've labored my whole life for for what come follow him and carry a cross this young ruler was offended at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ it is so sad that he was offended at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to go back and pick up on that sermon I mentioned, investment that the prophet of the Lord preached. And I want to kind of go back from paragraph 14. Because he's speaking on investment and he picks this young rich ruler as an example. And he speaks on investment. He says that a fellow that's got money wants to put, put it in a good investment, of course. A man that have as much as you say, let's say $10 million. I want to make it much bigger. He would like to put it in some kind of investment. He says, don't keep it in your pocket because you don't know, thieves will steal it. And so you, you don't want to do that. He says, you want, if you're good, a sound businessman, you want to put it in something and draw dividends or interest. You want to put it into something to usury. You know about the talent in the Bible. So you put it into some use that will draw dividends out of it. Some good, sound business. So you see he's pulling from the parable of the talents. When the Lord gave five here and two here and one here. Or five and three and one. And then he comes back and he asks for it. What did you do with it? The ones who worked with it and doubled it. He did what he rewarded them. The one who did not use it, he took it away. So the prophet of God is, is using that as an example and saying that if God blesses you financially, you want to put it somewhere, not in your pocket, but in some good investments. Uh, I hope you do pray before you make any investments. <laughs> because some of us have put money somewhere we thought were good investments. <laughs> and you ended up finding out that. It was good investment for the owner of that company, <laughs> but not for you. Oh, my. Anyways, and so you want to do that, do a sound business. And then he says, and then in doing this, you don't want to put it in something that is in sound. No man will want to do that. A good, smart businessman wouldn't think of such a thing. You men wouldn't do that. Put in something that one of these here get rich overnight and you don't know where it came from or where it come from, you better be careful about that. You lose all you got. How many can say amen to that? He said, cause it's a gamble. <laughs> and gambling is not good. It's not good sound business. It's got a chance to it. And you don't want to take them kind of chances. But you want to put it into something, in some, something good, in some f firm, that's 
that pays great dividends, something that's stable, reliable, something that you know has paid off, something that's proven that it will pay off. Now, when you have something like that, make your investment. Why? Then you feel assured you've got a something coming. You can rest assured when you put your money in that. But if your business is not too good, well, you wouldn't want to try it. Some good, reliable plan. Something that will pay you off well. Now, let's look at this. This rich young ruler, as we call it in the Bible, he passed up a great opportunity. He had the opportunity to put his riches of this world into a guaranteed plan. But he failed it. He didn't do it. He was given the opportunity that he could draw interest on. And make a great investment and he failed to accept the opportunity so much as many of us do today. And we find out that it is too bad, but we do it. Now, although this plan that he was offered was perfectly vindicated that it was sound. When Jesus came to earth, he proved that he was what he said he was. That he was God manifested in flesh. This young ruler called him good master and he said no one is good but God. That's written scripture. So he recognized his deity as God and yet still he passed up on the opportunity. He proved he was God. He said, if I do not do the works of my father, then don't believe me. So this young man was, was like this great, his rich Laodicean age that we live in. They've seen a great opportunity to invest in something. But it's not popular. Jesus was not a popular man in his days. Only among the poor and illiterate. The church of his day, the denomination of his day, or the sectarian religion had nothing to do with him. But there must have been something about him that this rich young fellow seen in Jesus that he did not see in others. See, I don't know, but the Lord keeps pointing this out to us. He found the Lord he had revelation of who he was, did he? He followed him in obedience to commandment. But yet when it came to the one thing that gives eternal life, I hope you know he was asking for the Holy Spirit. That is what gives you eternal life. When it comes to that one thing that makes a difference, the Holy Spirit in, in a believer that guarantees your eternal life, he passes up on the opportunity because the, the, the price to pay to gain it was too heavy for him. The prophet of God says that that's what we are doing today. That's what this great end time ministry, I should say church age of Laodicea is doing. And then he says, He did have the common good sense to come and ask what he might do. Because he had seen in Jesus that there was a quality that he, he didn't see in anyone else. But you see, he was very rich with the things of the world. And I think that oftentimes is a problem. Instead of becoming rich in the things of God, we become so rich and invested in the things of the world to our own detriment. I was listening to the testimony of a brother. Many of you may know him. Brother Perry, Brother Branham called him and said, Brother Perry, come start a church over here, moved from Texas. He was a rich businessman. You may have heard his story. And he was just contemplating whether it's the will of God because he owned about, I think, 21, I could be wrong about the exact number, businesses. And some of them were doing very well. 
And he had no thought, even though he's a believer, he had no thought of starting a church. But Branham called him and said that I want you to move to closer to, I think, uh, what was it, Arizona? And I want you to come to Arizona and start a church here. And for him to do that, it meant he had to close down his 20-something businesses and give all of them up just to become a pastor. Not only that, but you're coming to a city where you are not known <laughs> and you're starting something from scratch based on the word of Brother Branham. <laughs> so he had such a great dilemma and it took him a long time and every time Brother Branham told him, he said, ah, I'm going to pray about it. <laughs> and he said, I said I'm going to pray about it, but in my heart, I already knew it. I did not want to move. He said, you know what? It was easy for me to pass up on all my businesses that were not doing well. But he said that there were some of them, particularly one of them, that was so profitable that he never ever wanted to give up on that one. But you know what? When he finally decided he wanted to move, he said the businesses that he did not want, nobody wanted to buy those ones. But the one that's the most profitable and helping him to become rich and stable, those were the ones that everybody wants. So now he's thinking, is this the will of God? <laughs> really, does God want me to lose up on all these gains just to move to a place I don't know and to start a small fellowship somewhere? I don't even know anyone. I don't have a place. Just listening to the word of a prophet. Is that even right? This is where if you are not careful, your human side is going to act like this young rich ruler. He weighed the cost and he realized, uh, I don't know, I love the Lord, but I don't think what this man is saying is the only way. <laughs> So you know what? I may find another way. I may find another rabbi. I may find, you know, and, 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 and found an excuse not to do it. And the prophet of God tells us, bringing us to this, he says that we have a lovely picture of this in, in, in the Laodicean age in Revelation 3 because you say you are rich, you have need of nothing. He says, and you know not that you are what? Wretched, poor, blind, miserable, naked. You don't know it. So the looming picture that has been created in this court from Revelation chapter 3 is that it is possible for a person to become a believer because this man was an unbeliever. He is living by the law. By the standards of the law, you could call him a righteous man, just like the Pharisees. And his desire is in the right place. Oh, I want eternal life. I, I, I'll pretty much even pay whatever it takes for it. But when it gets to the real thing and the demand that must be met to get the real thing, he stumbles because he recognizes that the price is too heavy to pay. Can I just ask you, what it is that you are holding on to so firmly? That is becoming a stumbling block to your salvation. I don't know. I ask myself the same question. Lord, is there something that I'm so uh, uh, tight-fisted about that you want me to open up and give? Just so, Lord, it will be a release of the blessing that I'm looking for. You realize that you cannot ask the Lord to give me something, but then your hand is tightly fisted like this. Lord, give me. Where is he going to put it? <laughs> Unless first you open up what is inside there already and you empty that. Very, very simple thought, but the moment you look at what is going on and the prophet is aligning that and correlating it to the spirit of this age, that the man thought, you know what, I'm rich. You know what, I'm living by the law. Listen, maybe I don't even need to do none of these things. Let me just stay where I am and I'm fine. Later on, now let me just, I, I think I have a few more minutes. I want to move a little further. Read a few more quotes. That's a picture of this age. 
And he says, without a denomination, he says, let me, let me go back a little bit. That's the picture that we see today. Many of us people see God moving in the last days. We see the Holy Spirit come among us and vindicating the very promises of the Bible that Christ said would take place and yet with our denominational differences in our creed and our social standings as the young man had we turn down the opportunity like he does or like he did they were afraid to make the investment he would rather hold on to the things that he had the popularity the money the covetousness instead of putting his investment the opportunity knocked at his door to the kingdom of God. Hmm. And I see the same opportunity tonight. I love what Brother Antoine was saying before the service. Now how the enemy will come in and sometimes remind you and give you good solid re reasons why you should not make it for church. Good, solid, legitimate reasons. I'm with you. There are times I get up and I've just been so stretched and so stressed with the things of life and going through so much I can share. It's just recently that my wife was reminding me of something that had happened uh, during the pandemic. There was one point in my life where both my, my wife and my dad were going through surgery at the same time. At the same time. <laughs> And the demands of the church and, I'm, and, and the kids and everything. And I'm sitting here and I'm, Lord, <laughs> what's going on? But you know what? I don't even, re I don't even remember such a thing happening. See, the Lord will bring you through and then he'll replace those memories with his faithfulness. To the point that you will not even remember what you had to give up for what he's given to you. And I, I stand and I remember, how did you do it? I don't know. <laughs> but now when I think on that thought in my mind, it gives me strength to know that there is nothing I'm going through now that can overcome the God who pulled me through those things. I can imagine Job after he's gone through all of those things. I don't know whatever temptation he'll come his way that, he, he, that, that, will, that will buffet him or cause him to fret. No. I mean, come on. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, after coming out of the fire, do you think they'll be afraid of anything? Or Daniel, after coming out of the lion's den? No, you're funny. <laughs> like Paul, you know, after all the things he went through, and oh, the prophet comes and prophesy and tie his hands and say, oh, you're going to Jerusalem, this is how you'll be bound and to be killed. He said, oh, to die? <laughs> I've seen it all. It's game. <laughs> you see, I, I think that's what we need to realize that what God is asking of us is not to destroy us, but in fact it is what is going to break us out of this shell that we are in and propel us to the next level in our journey with God. We have to see that God is not asking of you because he's a wicked God. He's asking, what is that you have in your hand? Like he asked Moses when Moses is standing before the burning furnace, the burning bush. He says, Moses, what is that in your hand? He said, oh, it's just a walking stick, a shepherd's staff. He said, bring it. With this stuff, you shall deliver the people of Israel. That's all Moses had. God took that last thing that he had and he turned it around into a weapon against his enemy. How about the widow woman? Oh, my last piece of flour. And sometimes it sounds like he's so inconsiderate and so wicked. God, how can you take this from me? The prophet preached on blind Bartimaeus and he, he said how that he had, you know, he had a, a blind man's staff and then he had little uh, uh, turtle doves and maybe a little lamb that walked him around. And every time he got into trouble, he had to trade up one of those things that led him around until he had nothing. 
and not knowing that it was all part of God's plan to lead him in front of the master who would cause his eyes to open, then he was no more going to need a walking staff or turtle dove or little guide lamb or little animal. God is taking it because he's going to give you that breakthrough where you don't need those things anymore. But you see, when this young rich ruler passes on this opportunity, for the sake of time, I have to skip all these quotes I'm about to read. We later on find out the prophet of God comes back and he picks up on the story of Lazarus. How many know that? Luke chapter 16 from verse 22. He picks up on Lazarus and he connects the story of the rich man in Lazarus to this same young rich ruler. You remember that rich man who would set a table and eat with his friends and Lazarus laying by the entrance of his gateway or his driveway and his dogs are licking Lazarus' wound and this man who said, oh, I've obeyed all of the laws who could not demonstrate it by giving his things to the poor. You see the same thing. A poor man laying by the gate, he has abundance, but even his dog's food, he would not give it to the poor man. Until Lazarus died. And then the Bible says that angels came and carried Lazarus. Luke 16, 22. It carried him into Abraham's bosom, paradise. And then you find that the rich man also died. And then he was buried. But I want you to know that just as angels carried Lazarus, demons will carry that rich man. And then they take him to another place, not Abraham's bosom, not paradise. The Bible says, in hell, he lifts up his eye. But I wouldn't make that correlation, but the prophet of God makes that correlation. And then he points us it to us that the young rich ruler passes on eternal life, but he continues to live good. You see, sometimes we make a mistake of thinking that financial gain is approval of God's blessing. When you see a believer who is flourishing financially, oh my, how God has blessed that young brother, that young sister. It's not always so. Now he lifts up his eyes in hell and he's being tormented. And then he sees Lazarus. You see, the, the thing is now Lazarus is so far away because there's a big chasm between where he is and where Lazarus is. But now his eyesight is more than 2020. <laughs> now he immediately recognizes Lazarus. Oh, that's Lazarus afar off in Abraham's bosom. And then now he cries out and says, Father Abraham, listen, he says, Father Abraham, because he is a Jewish man who knew the law and knew his father, Abraham's seed. See, this comes back to what I was speaking about on Sunday. The mere fact that you are the seed of Abraham does not mean you are guaranteed a promise. Romans 9 says it's not he who is a seed, but this seed, thy seed, even Isaac specifically. It is he who does the will of the father. This rich man was a seed of Abraham, but he was not performing the will of the father. The Lord Jesus weighed his heart, his love for his neighbor, and his love for his riches, and the love for riches outweighed completely what he said on his lips. I've done these things since I was a young fellow. Now he's found here in hell. Now watch what he's asking for. What he would not have done or did not do for Lazarus when he was on earth. <laughs> now he's asking Lazarus to do for him. You failed to give Lazarus water, to give him food. Even the food of your dogs, Lazarus could not eat. They were licking Lazarus' wounds, the Bible said. But now he's crying out and saying, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip a finger into water to cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Watch the investment he made and the reward that he's reaping. The Bible says that 
There is a thing or a path that looks good. It looks straight in the sight of man. But the end thereof is what? Death or destruction. When he was on earth, he would look as if, man, this man is blessed. He's obeying the commandments. He's doing everything. He, he, he's seated in, uh, on high tables. He is paraded when we are talking about the most blessed people in the community. I see that error today in church when people come in and they are financially blessed believers. Oh my, hallelujah. That man must please God so much. And now, He's pleading for a drop of water. I want to bring it to an end. What an investment. The prophet of God said that the Lord Jesus presented to him a viable investment where he could withdraw his dividend from a proven source. He himself said that you are good, good master. He knew that's from a good master. He knew that's from a person whose words were, were yea and amen, true. And he had seen and heard miracles, signs and wonders, and yet he passed on it. Why am I bringing this up? Because he correlates that to the Laodicean spirit. And he says it's the same thing happening today. How people are passing up on the word of God. Well, someone will tell you, oh, you really mean to tell me it's God who told you to move here? And go struggle the way you're struggling. As if God doesn't want us to struggle. God wants you to have a smooth life. Bless you, give you. Come on, how are you going to do that? And then, in the end, Lazarus, who struggled through the whole thing. He finds himself in Abraham's bosom. There is a quote I read somewhere, and I may not remember to quote it verbatim, but I want to paraphrase. The person said, life here on earth, time, is the shorter end of eternity. However, where you spend eternity, the long end, is determined by the short tip of time. Look at this glaring picture. You only have 60, 70, at most 80 years maybe. The most blessed people 100 years. That is such a short time when you go back to Genesis and you realize people are living 969 years and change. But yet that very short number of years we have here. How we use it and where we invest that time is what is going to determine where we spend the longest bit that is at the tail end called eternity. And whose hand you trust that time in is what's going to determine it. Don't you see, brothers and sisters, that what you are doing for the Lord now, the Bible says, the Lord Jesus says, that put your treasure up in heaven. Where the, 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 the worms, the moth, and, and, and all of these uh, canker worm and palmer worm and the destroyers will not be able to destroy it. But you put it in the things of this earth and then you overlook such a great opportunity. Just as this young rich ruler. In the end, he realized what kind of investment he's passed up on. I want to point out certain things before we, we, we bow our heads and pray. I know it's a simple thought, but think over this deeply. Because sometimes we pass up on the nuggets of very simple thoughts. Remember he asked for Father Abraham to do him a favor or change his condition that he was in at the time. But the answer was, it is too late and it is impossible. I submit to you today that the day we leave this earth, there is nothing we can take with us. No investment, no houses, cars, well, whatever savings, insurance, nothing we can take with us. The only the things that we do for God will stand as a testimony for us as believers. 
In this past year or two, I've seen many loved ones that I know very close and dearly passed on and gone beyond the curtain of time. And sometimes you sit down and you wonder. So all these things they labored for, they could not take a single one of them with, together on their journey out of this earth. They were buried alone because the Bible says, alone you came, alone you shall go. From dust you came, shall from dust you shall return. Naked you came. Naked you shall go. Such a glaring picture of a whole human being. Maybe whilst on earth so powerful. I have seen a quote from, uh, uh, what's his name? Steve Jobs. Whilst he was on his dying bed. And some of the things that he was saying. What he was going through. And he, this man was rich. One of the richest men on the surface of the earth. He, he could have traded money for any kind of service. Just to sustain his life. Another, another five years or ten years or twenty years. But you see at that point in time. There, that was nothing money could purchase. Oh don't you see it. What you do for the Lord is not in vain. Lazarus struggled. Lazarus never enjoyed life. He looked as if all the time that God had neglected him. Unfortunately, we humans equate poverty to a curse. God has forsaken you. God is not with you. Like the friends of Job told him when he was going through his trial. They said, oh man. <laughs> you are not a righteous man. God is not with you. No righteous man will go through the things you're going through. But yet, it was the opposite. God had so much confidence in him. That God would bet on him against the devil. And say that this is my son. I trust him that no matter what you take from him. He will stand on my word. Can we make such an investment in the Lord? Can we look at what we gain from God and say that Lord I, I think I've not given you enough. <laughs> in fact when I look at it now. And I see all the things that you have in store for me. I don't think I'm giving enough. Any time I come to this junction and crossroad and I realize, Lord, it looked as if I'm giving so much. And I'm reminded of some of these things. I realize, oh my, I've been giving enough. Nothing close to the men who gave their lives to be burned, some crucified upside down. Some fed to animals. This gospel that we are holding. Bleeding with the blood of disciples. But yet they knew they were making the right investment. When they sacrificed their lives for the kingdom of God's sake. And you know what? Now is your time. Now is my time. Now we may say, oh, you know, I'm not like this guy. Oh, Lord, you know I can give anything for you. But how many times do we make excuses just on coming to church? Alone. <laughs> oh, sometimes small headed. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. Sometimes even, you see, the Lord discerned his heart and tried him on what he was declaring. So the Lord is not going to tempt you or test you on what he tested on him. He's going to weigh your heart and figure out what it is that you are holding on to that makes it so hard for you to sacrifice to the Lord. Don't you see it? I've gone through this. I don't know if it's the right time for me to say this. Maybe I wait until the Lord lays on my heart. But there are certain things I was holding on to. Certain possession, property, certain things are holding on to it. No matter what, I, I, no, I'm not going to get this rid of these things. But it got to a time when the Lord was practically saying, hey, man, <laughs> you got to move in obedience to me and know that I'm able to take care of you and not depend on certain things. God took some things away from us. Just so we can learn to depend on him. In the end, 
Now we can stay back and say, what a great transaction. Those things would have been temporal, lasted a short while. But he took that and he gave to us eternal blessings that money cannot buy. Tonight, would you go back and evaluate your life and choices and say, Lord, may I not pass up on such opportunities, but help me that I will not be blind and pass on some of the sacrifices that you've, you've put my way as a doorway and entrance to my eternal salvation. Help me, Lord, that I'll not fail in those things, but that, Lord, I would take the opportunity and like Lazarus in the end, like Paul in the end, I will receive a crown of glory. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, Lord Jesus, Lord, I feel like I didn't speak on anything so deep. A simple thought, Lord. And yet even myself, I'm condemned by the word when I think, Father, I sometimes the sacrifice and the weight is heavy. And oh, Lord, your word it reproves me and thy rod and thy staff, it chastises and then yet it comforts me, helping me to know, Lord, you will never ask of your child. The two... Uh, fishes, pieces of fish and, and, and the five loaves of bread you took from this young little boy's lunch. You only took it just to bless it and multiply it for the multitude. Lord, how does sometimes we become so tight-fisted thinking that in, in saving it we'll gain more, but the word says in saving it we shall lose it. Father, Lord, help us. Help me, Lord, because this word is for me. This message is for me, Lord. May I not pass up on the opportunity, Lord. May I not put my trust in anything that I have in my hand, any man-made thing. But like Moses, Lord, may I be ready to give it up unto you. Hand it over into your capable hand, Lord. Father, Lord Jesus, I pray for your children, your sons and your daughters. I pray for anyone who hears this. And Lord, if your spirit be in the preaching of the word, then let this word break them in their hearts, O oh Lord. Let it provoke them unto righteousness. Let this word inspire the sons and daughters of God to stay fully committed to this cause, this gospel cross that we are carrying. Help us, Lord, that we will not put our trust in anything material no riches no gains no popularity no power no education none of those things but that our full trust lord will be in you and your word i pray tonight any one of us who's made such mistakes in the past father lord forgive us forgive us lord for we knew not what we were doing but lord help us father that we will not see our brothers and sisters struggling and just pass by. Help us, Lord, that we will not pass up an opportunity to be a blessing to someone else. Help us, Lord, that we will not pass up on an opportunity to do something for the body of Christ and for the kingdom of God. Father, Lord, help us to seek first the kingdom and His righteousness. I pray, Heavenly Father, all those who are making such decisions and such sacrifices for the kingdom's sake bless them oh lord may their labor and their sacrifices never be in vain but like lazarus father oh may you give unto them eternal life lord and finally lord when the time on this earth is past they will look back at that eternal great reward that you shall give unto all those who overcome I ask these things in the glorious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I surrender.
us to reflect on these thoughts and know there is no sacrifice you make for the Lord that will go without a reward none of it shall be in vain let me add one more thought to this as we leave one time Peter I believe he was reflecting on his losses I've left my wife I've left my family I've left my job as a fisherman I've left everything, Lord, and I've come here and I've followed you. And it seems following you, we've just been jumping from trouble to trouble, sacrifice upon sacrifice upon sacrifice. So Peter's question was, Oh, Lord, <laughs> what shall we gain? <laughs> we've given up everything. What shall we gain? Thank you, Brother Antoine, for continuing that Jesus looked at him do you know this is right after the, the, the story we read he answered and said unto him verily I say unto you there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels but he shall receive watch here a hundredfold when when you know we always make it sound like the blessing is only up there he said when now in this time houses brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life so not only will God replace the things that we are giving up and losing for the kingdom's sake he shall multiply like we find a type of this in Job God did that. Look at Abraham. He left his possession in the father's house. Let me give everyone an assignment. Go and look for a book written by Josephus Flavius. If you don't have it, I can forward it to you. It's, it's titled the, the Antiquities of the Jews. But Abraham quotes from that book a lot. And so I thought, you know what, I'll find it and look into it. It speaks about Abraham. And that book says that Abraham, oftentimes when you read in the Bible, it looks as if Abraham was a simple man. I know Brother Branham calls that a lot, you know. God deals with the simple men, the fishermen, the farmers and all that. But that book goes back into Abraham's history and says he was one of the most powerful men in Babylon. He was so rich. That's how Abraham, when he's moving, he's moving with Lot and then his servants the Bible doesn't tell us exactly but Abraham moved with so much power and possession Abraham was giving up so much when God said leave Babylon and leave your father's house he had to leave back all his his influence and the land that he's conquered and the kingdom that he was reigning over in his father's home and kingdom I didn't know this but a book of history was reflecting on this what Abraham was giving up for what? A voice that told him, leave your father's house. No wonder when God brings Abraham to the promised land, he blesses him to the point that the Canaanites look at Abraham and they say that we know that you are blessed and our land is blessed because of you. In fact, he says that you are a prince among us. Look at what they said. God blessed Abraham to the point that the whole south side of Canaan where they were living could not contain Abraham and Lot, two men. Their possession could not fit there. Look at the Lord Jesus saying here in Matthew 10. He says, if you give those things up for me, not only will you receive eternal blessings, but here. But the secret is we must first be willing to give that which we have worked for to the Lord. We are not more on live stream, are we? We still are. Okay. There are some things I want to say that I can't put it in a live stream. I don't know. The Lord just put it out of my heart and I can keep going. 
I don't want to put that out there. It's something I can share for the blessings of the local assembly later on. See, those of you, if you want to know when you're on a live stream, find where we are. <laughs> and then you can hear the rest of that testimony. But I'm telling you that when God takes from your hand, it's because God has something better to put back there. I'm a living testimony. There are some things I can't share and put in public domain, so I'll leave it here. The Lord richly bless you. Wherever you find yourself, serve the Lord in all diligence. And make this great investment. And you shall never regret. Amen.